Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great decisions discussion of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg. I'm Joyce Davis, and I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Harrisburg, and we are delighted once again to uh, be sponsoring this series of programs uh, with the Fredrickson Library. Tonight, we are quite honored and privileged to have with us an expert from the United States Institute of Peace, Jason Tower, who has just joined us. But guess what? Jason is not in Pennsylvania. Jason is actually joining us. And it's, a, it's almost, I guess, now 6 o'clock in the morning. Or, uh, uh, and he's joining us from Thailand where he will basically be able to give us a firsthand view of how things are in the region. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Joyce. Pleasure to be here. I appreciate okay. the invitation. Well, I am going to give a, a much fuller introduction to you in just a bit after we do our Great Decisions um, uh, video. We'll have that done. And then we will, they know the way it goes. We will hear from you and then we'll accept Q&A from those who are attending. We'll also be monitoring our Facebook page as well. So with that, I would ask everyone to just sit back, relax. We'll have uh, Zach, who's uh, in the background there, now begin our Great Decisions video. After that, we'll come back and I'll introduce Jason. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Great Decisions 2022. Today, we reach the midway point in this nine lecture master class by turning our attention to topic number five, Myanmar and ASEAN. ASEAN is a political and economic alliance in Southeast Asia. It today faces a great challenge in Myanmar, where a coup d'etat has installed a military dictatorship and ASEAN has been called upon to address it. But the alliance's challenges are significantly more than internal because the major power surrounding and to the north of ASEAN is the People's Republic of China. Here you can see Myanmar in red. It is on the western edge of the ASEAN alliance, a very long border to the north and east with China. And this shows us the ASEAN alliance and its 10 member states. China to the north has made significant claims to the South China Sea, well beyond that which is considered normal or acceptable under prevailing international law. And in many ways, not only China's military rise of late, but also its extended claims of sovereignty in the South China Sea have served to unify the ASEAN members against it. Before we can consider US foreign policy options relating to Myanmar and ASEAN, we should first consider Myanmar itself, followed by the ASEAN alliance, and then finally take into consideration the various regional dynamics at play as it relates to the crisis in Myanmar. First, we begin with Myanmar. As you can see, it was part of the old British Empire. At the time, the most dominant political force in the world, the United Kingdom in the 19th century and leading into World War I had vast territorial claims across the international arena including Burma, which is present-day Myanmar. Myanmar was occupied by the Japanese during World War II. And here you can see on the left-hand side a graph showing the amphibious landing and the penetration into Myanmar by Japanese military forces. There was a concerted Allied effort uh, to take Myanmar back from Japan. The numbers. Myanmar became an independent, recognized nation in 1948. That puts it into the category of newly independent countries. It is roughly the size of the great state of Texas with 57 million people, the vast majority of which are Burman, and the overwhelming majority in terms of religious belief are Buddhist. The per capita income of $5,142 is not very impressive. This is a poor country. In terms of ethnic groups, the dominant group would be the Burmans. You can see them in areas marked in white, 
others, such as the Karen, the Chin, among others, uh, are designated by color on this map. What is not shown are the Rohingya people. They are roughly one million in size, although the numbers vary greatly depending on one's source. They are Muslim, which sets them apart. And since 2016, they have been the subject of a genocide. The allegation of genocide, of course, is very significant. It is the targeting with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a person or people based upon any of a number of characteristics, including religion and ethnicity. So when the international community says genocide is happening in Myanmar, this is a serious allegation. As the violence has unfolded, the Rohingya have moved out of state, fled, as you can see from this graph, into neighboring countries up to Bangladesh, but predominantly to Indonesia and Malaysia, creating a refugee crisis. On a separate note, Myanmar is also troubled by the fact that it is considered the world's meth lab, with significant amounts of illicit drugs being produced in country and shipped abroad. Let's take a look at the leadership of Myanmar since its independence in 1948. At that point, it was a monarchy. A king was in power. He was assassinated in 1962 when the military made a coup d'etat, taking power and keeping it throughout the Cold War and well into the 21st century. Democracy arrived in Myanmar in 2011. It lasted until 2021, when yet another coup d'etat occurred, returning the country to military leadership. Let's look at the democracy of Myanmar. Most people associate it with one person, Aung San Suu Kyi. She is the recipient of the 1991 Nobel Peace Prize because she was the leader of the resistance movement to the military. She was the face of the resistance, living under house arrest year after year. In 2015, she became the head of government. She could not assume the title of president or prime minister because that was expressly forbidden in the constitutional changes made back in 2011. The military clearly feared her. She has been, however, silent on the Rohingya genocide, at one point stating there's violence on both sides, which is a way of saying that, well, the Rohingya are being targeted, but for just reason. They have exhibited acts of violence, and the state of Myanmar is simply returning that violence upon them. The coup d'etat that took place in 2021 has its origins in the 2020 national election, the results of which were going to be certified in 2021 with a swearing-in ceremony. One day before that ceremony, the military made its move, arresting leaders who had been elected for a variety of offenses, including campaign law violations and violations of COVID measures in Myanmar. Over the course of the next month and a half, over 700 civilians were killed and more than 3,000 were detained. These numbers only increased throughout 2021. The ASEAN Alliance, the organization of states that should play a role in resolving the crisis in Myanmar. You can see from this graph, it is geographically located in Southeast Asia. It was established in 1967. Its membership has nearly doubled to 10 by 2022, and it promotes social, economic, and military cooperation among its member states. Its mission has evolved. Back in 1967, it was limited in membership largely because of its desire to counter neighboring Vietnam, the emerging power in Southeast Asia. It talked a great deal about multinational cooperation on a wide range of issues, which is, of course, its primary focus today as well. But in the mid-1990s, the mission of ASEAN changed 
to countering not Vietnam, but China. And for that reason, Vietnam was allowed to join the very organization that was created to counter its growth in power. Such is the nature of world politics. Alliances have one common problem relating to internal strife. So here we show a graph of a dominant power. It could be regional or international, and then a handful of smaller nations, each one of them vulnerable, should the larger nation decide to invade it. For a matter of deterrence, they bind themselves together in a formal or informal alliance. An attack on one will be considered an attack upon all. And in so doing, they create a balance of power. Other nations, of course, can join if those who are currently members accept them, further strengthening the balance against the larger country. If, however, there is a problem within the alliance, such as Myanmar today, the tendency is to prioritize the original mission of the alliance, countering the large party, as opposed to dealing with problems inside of it. We saw this with NATO in 1974 when Turkey invaded Cyprus. And we're seeing it today with ASEAN addressing the crisis in Myanmar, simply sweeping it under the rug. The violence in Myanmar is significant. Undoubtedly, people are suffering. And the military coup has not been well received by the general public. It has caused people to leave their homes for safety, to flee across the nation and cross international boundaries. So let's now look at the regional dynamics at play. First, we'll start with ASEAN. How has it responded to the crisis in Myanmar? It issued what it called a five-point consensus. All of the members of ASEAN agreed on five basic points, three of which are noteworthy. The call for a cessation of violence, appointment of a special envoy. An envoy is someone selected by a head of state, an organization, or an alliance to be the point person of communication, of contact, and negotiation on a particular issue. We, for example, have special envoys for countries, for regions, or even for themes. Myanmar, of course, a crisis within ASEAN, deserved a special envoy, someone who could speak between Myanmar and the ASEAN alliance. And finally, ASEAN promoted humanitarian assistance to relieve the suffering of the people of Myanmar. There was, however, noteworthy, no call for the release of Aung San Suu Kyi, who is back under house arrest. This is an example of sweeping a problem under the rug. This is not a strong action. This is not collective action with a specific intent, except to be able to publicly claim we're dealing with this issue and we've done all that we can do. Let's look at the influential actors in region. If we were to divide them into three categories from most important and impacting at the top to least important and impacting at the bottom, ASEAN would go there along with the United Nations. This is an alliance that has chosen not to get deeply involved and an organization that has very few options at its disposal. In our middle category of moderately influential countries, I would put Japan, the United States, the UK, and the European Union. Their economic power is substantial. If they decided in concert to economically punish those responsible for the coup in Myanmar, it would certainly have a significant impact. But at the very top is Australia. It is a regional power. It is one that has enormous influence in Southeast Asia and with Myanmar. So how has Australia responded to the coup? Forcefully or in a more reserved fashion? It is the latter, acting more like ASEAN in its response, which effectively takes Australia out of the calculation. So let's now look at American foreign policy options. First and foremost, we are a very great distance from Myanmar, more than 8,500 miles. Americans do not prioritize Myanmar. 
Very few are familiar with the situation that's happening in Southeast Asia, and the United States does not have a long history of investment or engagement in Myanmar. China, on the other hand, shares a common border with Myanmar that's more than 1,300 miles long. So clearly among the major powers, China is the most influential. Let's take a look then at China. The most influential actor, the leader of that region, a country that is deeply concerned about the anti-China sentiment that is bubbling over in Myanmar. Many in the resistance movement, in the general public, believe that China was behind the 2021 coup d'etat, that it gave a green light because it preferred the military leadership over the elected leadership of Myanmar. There has been a spike in anti-China crime, and that will likely continue, given the sentiment of the people of Myanmar. China is also very concerned about an explosion of COVID on that long common border. After all, if people are out protesting, if they're congregating in large areas, that is a recipe for COVID expansion, and that is not what China wants. And finally, China has to be concerned about the economic corridor that it has established through Myanmar that could be jeopardized by violence in the country. China has tended to prefer elected officials in countries that it deals with. The reason for that is rather straightforward. When China approaches a country about economic engagement, it tends to ask, what do your people need? If it's light rail or a port system, if it's telecommunications, if it's a psychiatric ward or a rum factory, I mean, the whole range of options, the Chinese are going to provide it, either through long-term low interest loans, technical supports, or state-to-state -state grants. And what the Chinese are doing are building strong relations with publics, with the various members of the public of the countries they engage. And so they're concerned about a coup d'etat that they are going to be blamed for, whether or not they had a role to play in it. Here you can see the economic corridor. It is part of the much larger Chinese design on global economic expansion. It runs through Myanmar, on its way to Bangladesh and India. The U.S. relations with Myanmar have risen and fallen, uh, falling during the time of the late military leadership in the early 2000s, rising significantly when democracy arrived in 2011, and then tapering off with the recent coup d'etat. The underlying context of American foreign policy calculations, we don't have any vital interest that are at risk in Myanmar. A military response is extraordinarily unlikely, in part because of the region and our experience in Vietnam, but more importantly because there probably isn't a military solution to Myanmar, and certainly not one that we would pursue. Economic blockades, cyber attacks are probably out a bit over the top. Targeted economic sanctions make a lot of sense raising the cost of those who committed the act of the coup, but we're certainly not going to be willing to attach America's reputation to what happens ultimately in Myanmar. We've been burned in this country before. The Obama administration invested a great deal of energy and attention towards Myanmar. You can see Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in country visit, when the military decided that it would allow for a peaceful transition of power, we took away our economic sanctions and upgraded our diplomatic presence in the country. So the Obama administration was invested in turning Myanmar from a military government to a democracy in hopes of aligning with it as part of its pivot towards Asia. We've now been burned to some extent by the 2021 coup. So what exactly is our foreign policy path? Well, we should probably act in concert with other major powers, including the United Kingdom, the European Union, Japan, Australia, perhaps India. India could be an amazingly influential power if it wanted to in Myanmar. 
To date, it has not indicated a willingness to do so. A lot of risk for India. It is reluctant to attach its reputation to the outcome of this coup d'etat. Targeted economic sanctions, targeted travel sanctions, and targeted social sanctions could all be employed by these major economic powers against those responsible for the military coup. Probably not going to result in any significant change, given that most of those in charge in Burma are deeply invested in their country and in the government that they now are controlling. We will very likely pursue a policy of some suspended aid. We do want to be careful here because much of the aid that we send to Myanmar, even though it's channeled through government offices, makes its way to the people of the country. There is the reality of aid leakage. Any time that we make a donation to a targeted group within a country, it is going to be distributed by the national government and state institutions. Along the way, people will take a cut. We lose anywhere from 10 to 40% of targeted aid because of this phenomenon of leakage. And while many people argue that we should probably stop donating if the aid is going to be siphoned off into deep pockets, as the most generous country in the world, the United States probably does not want to raise the expectation level so high on aid delivery. There's just a simple reality that it is the cost of doing business. So if we are going to suspend aid, we have to be very careful such that we don't punish the very people of Myanmar who we are trying to assist. We can also dangle some carrots in front of the military leadership of Myanmar. There are things that they want and that we can offer it would take some direct communication to clearly identify them and then set the conditions for those rewards being offered. I'm not sure at all that we can be willing to offer enough to make any sort of transition back to democracy possible in Myanmar. The violence continues. The protests go on unabated. Uh, the body bags, of course, are piling up. We should think about broadening the focus beyond just Myanmar. I mean, that is the crisis. That is the focus of this great decisions topic. But so is the alliance that surrounds it, that includes Myanmar. So let's take a look at the ASEAN alliance and America's relationship with it. In 2021, ASEAN held its annual summit. President Biden was invited and he did attend. He made a $100 million pledge in aid to ASEAN members. This aid was designed to support health care spending, promote the climate initiative, education, and economic recovery in the post-COVID era. We spoke in an earlier lecture about the three levels of foreign policy challenges that we can place great decisions topics in. At the highest level are existential threats, the ones that alter the trajectory of history. Then there are the routine high politics issues that occupy easily 90% of our foreign policy makers' time, energy, and planning. And then finally are the low politics, promotion of democracy abroad, engaging with smaller powers, and promoting human rights and dignity. It is not to say that low politics don't matter, but it is to say foreign policy makers look at them as tertiary concerns. Myanmar falls in that category. It is a small power. We're dealing with issues of democracy and human rights. It is not on the front burner of the Biden administration. I want to thank you for attending this lecture, encourage you to stay engaged, and make great decisions. Well, that was depressing. <laughs> We're going to have a conversation now. Listen, let me uh, let me now introduce uh, Jason Tower and tell you a little bit about him, because uh, he's going to lead us in our in our conversation uh, tonight on um, uh, what is clearly something that, that, that is just heartbreaking uh, to, to hear. 
But Jason Tower is with the United States Institute of Peace and he joined in late 2019 as the country director for the Burma program based in Yangon. Prior to joining USIP, Towers served in senior positions with several other peace building organizations in China and in Southeast Asia. And between 2009 and 2017, he worked to establish the Beijing Office of the American Friends Service Committee, and he initiated programs across North and Southeast Asia on the impacts of cross-border investments on conflict dynamics. He's also led a series of research initiatives relevant to China's role in peacekeeping operations in East Asia and on China's evolving role in international conflict dynamics. Now, Tower has worked extensively in Burma on peace and security issues. In fact, from 2018 to 2019, he served as Southeast Asia Program Manager for the Peace Nexus Foundation, managing a portfolio of grants and partnerships in China, Burma, and Cambodia. I needn't go into all of his academic credentials. They are significant, but I will say that he is fluent in Mandarin and having studied it, I know that's saying something. He's published widely in China's involvement in peace and security uh, issues and uh, with recent publications on the Belt and Road Initiative and a report based on years of experience working with Chinese corporate stakeholders. So that's a lot of credentials. And let me tell you, I don't think we would be able to have uh, Jason and uh, uh, um, join us if it weren't for Zoom now. So we, despite all of the drawbacks and setbacks that we're experiencing now, because we can't do a lot in, per in person, Zoom is making it possible for us to have this level of expertise join us. So welcome, Jason, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, very nice to have the opportunity to be here uh, uh, this this morning for me, this this evening for you out there um, in in the U.S. Um, I did have a couple of visuals that I'm I'm going to try to to put up on the the screen here um, as I talk through a couple of points, um, picking up some of the things that came out there in in the video. Um, maybe first, just to say, um, United States Institute of Peace is founded uh, almost uh, 40 years ago now by the U.S. Congress. It's an independent institute that works uh, globally on peace and conflict issues. Uh, its its um, mandate is around the mitigation of, of violent conflict. Uh, we work both through um, our analysis of, of violent conflict, uh, as well as through field offices that support uh, practitioner efforts to try to address conflict on the ground. And there's often a lot of synergies between the work that we do, um, the analytical work that we do, uh, researching different aspects of conflict and conflict dynamics, uh, and then applying that, that uh, the findings of that work uh, in the field, um, then learning also from our involvement with practitioners uh, about uh, just new, new challenges in, in the field of, of peace building. Um, the Institute, I should say, uh, while founded by Congress, is independent. So uh, what I say does not represent uh, the view of, of the US government. Um, and uh, what I'll share here uh, for everyone this evening represents uh, my, my own views. Um, USIP is active uh, around the world. You can see here in uh, more than uh, 50 countries. Um, and we've had a presence in Burma since uh, 2012. Um, working around a range of, of, of conflict issues, including both uh, issues at the intercommunal level. I think the presentation just now talked about all of the ethnic diversity that you have in, in Myanmar. Fortunately, though, throughout Myanmar's history, you've never really had an effort to build an inclusive national identity. So one of the much deeper drivers of conflict in country is that you've really seen um, particularly since its, its independence, uh, uh, Burmar, the, the dominant Burmar group uh, really focus on um, using uh, the military, using, um, you know, kind of a very hard power approach to um, advance uh, its own narratives of, of states uh, that are very narrow and not inclusive of the many other um, uh, ethnic uh, groups in, in country. And for that reason, you've seen uh, resistance, particularly around all of the borderlands in Myanmar, which has been an ongoing factor of the 
uh, civil war that you've seen, which is actually the longest standing civil war in the Asia region. Um, I should also say that some of what I'll share uh, here this evening um, comes from a um, Myanmar study group. Uh, so USIP will, will often facilitate senior study groups on different issues of concern for, for US uh, foreign policy. Uh, we initiated one of these groups not long after the, the military coup. Um, the intention was to bring a group of leading US experts together uh, to look uh, forward at different scenarios that might potentially emerge, and then to think through how the US might potentially mount a more robust response to um, some of the different things taking shape uh, in, in country. So uh, the report was launched on February 1st. Uh, if, if you'd like to take a look at it, it's up on our website, and there's a link to it here in the, uh, in the PowerPoint, which I'm sure could be shared uh, following um, uh, the presentation here. Um, so shifting to the, the situation in country, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief so that we have more time uh, for interaction and, and, and dialogue, but I did want to pick up on a, a couple of uh, what I think are pretty critical points to, to consider, uh, particularly as we think about the international policy response to uh, the coup and to the ongoing violence in country. The first thing that I really want to emphasize is that the February 1st, uh, 2021 coup um, is an unmitigated disaster, uh, really on every level imaginable. Um, not only were 10 years of democratic reforms uh, almost erased overnight, uh, but you also immediately started to see economic impacts of the coup. Um, the economy had already been suffering due to COVID-19, um, but now you're seeing um, more and more uh, uh, across the country, uh, people falling under the poverty line. You're seeing uh, people have difficulty finding just very basics, uh, being able to afford food, um, getting access to water, electricity. The World Bank estimates that if it weren't for COVID and the coup, the economy would be 30% larger today than it actually is. So that gives you a sense of just how dramatic the economic impacts of this um, have been. I think the other important statistic, though, is that um, close to 50% of the population is going to be uh, falling below the poverty line in the imminent future. So. These, I think, uh, give you a little bit of sense of, of the, the economic picture. You've seen also a lot of international businesses that entered uh, Myanmar, um, looking at the country as a real growth space just a few years ago, have now exited. This includes major international oil companies, which recently exited, uh, a wide range of, of retailers, businesses. Um, you're really seeing a lot of these, these global companies that had uh, chosen to invest in Myanmar are now cutting their losses and, and pulling out, which of course is having a further toll on, on the economy. Turning to a few other areas, of course, you've now seen Myanmar really fall into full civil war. It's become one of the most violent countries in the world. Actually, um, if you go back to um, you know, the months uh, before the coup, it was relatively speaking, um, fairly peaceful. I mean, you had significant fighting in um, uh, Rakhine State, which is um, to the west uh, along the, the coast of the Indian Ocean. Um, you had pockets of fighting in other parts of the country. But you can see here from this chart how um, the number of violent incidences has increased dramatically. And as of September, uh, Myanmar surpassed Syria to become the most violent country in the world. That trajectory has continued. Of course, we now have new horrific violence in the Ukraine following Russia's invasion there. So um, both Myanmar and, and the Ukraine, I think, are now um, the, the top uh, places across the globe where you're seeing you know, extremely high levels of, of violence. This violence has resulted, of course, in mass displacements. Um, because borders are closed uh, during COVID-19, particularly the border, um, the China border, the Thailand border, the India border has been closed on and off. A lot of the people who are fleeing conflict, unfortunately, can't cross borders. So they're often fleeing into uh, ethnic areas where there might not be as much fighting. They're going underground and into hiding in different places. But estimates are that uh, upwards of 500,000 to 600,000 people have been displaced um, since 
uh, the February 1st, 2021 coup. Those numbers are likely only to go up as we're seeing um, the scale of violence continue across uh, the country. Another important thing to point out is that uh, basic public services and functions have disappeared. Um, the education system has collapsed. Uh, most people no longer have access now to education. Uh, enrollments in public schools are way down. A lot of the uh, public school uh, staff uh, uh, have joined the civilian disobedience movement, um, leaving their positions, um, many of them being dismissed from their positions for, our, for joining that movement. But you've really seen basic public services like education, like health, uh, decimated as a result of the just very broad uh, rejection of the military's uh, power move and its efforts to um, reassert dictatorship in, in Myanmar. Um, you've also seen uh, basic public services like uh, public security, policing, these sorts of things uh, become non-existent. You hear regularly stories of murders in Yangon, violent crimes in other parts of the country. There's no longer a police force that will respond to any of these sorts of things. So you're seeing increasingly the population have to turn to other sorts of measures to keep themselves uh, safe and protected from um, these types of, of activities. Um, you're also seeing, and I think uh, this is another uh, area where there really are a lot of international implications, a dramatic rise in crime across the country and changing patterns of transnational crime uh, across, uh, across Myanmar and across the region as a result of, of the coup. Um, Myanmar already had major problems with um, narcotics, with um, illegal casinos run by Chinese triad groups across the country with fraud operations, trafficking, um, these sorts of issues uh, before the coup. And you've seen a lot of these forms of activities really ramp up uh, post coup as the former NLD government was really trying to find ways to address some of these criminal activities. The, mil the, the military both has no legitimacy to address them and actually is uh, supporting um, some of its militia groups in the China and Thai borders to ramp up uh, criminal activity that had been cracked down on by the NLD government. And thus you're seeing an explosion of crime along the China border and along the Thailand border. So this just gives you kind of a picture of just how um, awful things have, have gotten in, in country. And really I think also should, um, help us to see that this is not something that can be contained within Myanmar's borders, it's gonna have implications for the region. So this is very much a regional problem, meaning that the regional architecture needs to be focused on it, but more importantly, the US also needs to be thinking about it in terms of its Indo-Pacific strategy, which was just launched a few days ago and has um, uh, ref quite, quite a number of references to, to Myanmar um, uh, as well in that document. Now. Um, shifting next to uh, a couple of other interesting features of the conflict that I think are also important for consideration. Uh, one of these are the dynamics between um, several different parties that are all vying for uh, control, all vying to uh, really establish control either in their immediate uh, areas or over the country more, more broadly. First of all, you have, uh, of course, the military junta, which has established something called the State Administrative Council, which has zero legitimacy across the country. Um, this is a military governing body that is, according to the military, uh, supposed to follow a five-point roadmap to uh, restore what they're referring to as a disciplined democracy with the intention of having another round of elections in 2023. Our view is that these elections are not going to happen. Um, you simply don't have administrative functions at the local level that will enable elections to happen at this point. And the vast majority of political parties do not see the military as uh, a uh, legitimate actor to be organizing elections, particularly since it violently overturned uh, the results of the 2020 uh, election. Um, as a result, the military really has only one tool to try to maintain control. Um, that is violence, uh, oppression, and really uh, trying to restore something of a security state across the country where they're using all sorts of 
uh, shock and awe types of tactics uh, using intelligence gathering on the population and these sorts of uh, tactics to establish uh, rule by violence across the country. Now, before the coup, you have uh, across Myanmar, many very powerful uh, ethnic armed organizations. Um, some of these armed organizations have been involved in violent struggle against uh, central Burman authorities for up to 70 years. Um, after the coup, you've seen some of these uh, ethnic armed organizations uh, come out very publicly to denounce the military's move and to um, uh, effectively uh, reject any involvement in future peace processes with uh, the Myanmar military. There had been in place some form of a peace process, not a very successful one. It included about 10 of the uh, ethnic armed organizations, but mostly the smaller ones had been engaging in this process, representing less than 20% of the overall forces of Myanmar's ethnic armies. Um, following the coup, some of the ethnic armies are really gaining in terms of their ability to influence territory, control territory. Some of them are responding by actively fighting uh, the military, uh, taking new territory, so actually being able to um, make military progress in securing new positions, controlling new territories they hadn't controlled before. While other uh, ethnic armed organizations, particularly in Shan states, uh, which sits between uh, China, Laos, and Thailand um, up here in um, the eastern corner of, of Myanmar, in Shan state, you're actually seeing these EAOs uh, fight one another uh, for a process of uh, really controlling more of some of the vital uh, transportation corridors through Shan, Shan state. Uh, but also keeping in mind that most of the narcotics production in Myanmar is in that state. So in some sense, this battle is also about control over who is going to be, um, you know, managing that uh, growing market for the production of, of these different forms of, of narcotics. Um, then in um, uh, Rakhine State, uh, which is again uh, here to the, the western part of the country along the Indian coast, You've seen uh, one of the youngest of Myanmar's um, ethnic armed organizations, the Arakan Army, really rise uh, in the years uh, before the coup and following the coup to go from having almost no presence in that part of the country to really controlling now significant territory and starting to consolidate some governance functions. Um, so as you can see, the, the ethnic armed organizations are actually clear winners of uh, the, the chaos and conflict and so far as they're now able to fill in some of the gaps of, uh, you know, in governance, some of the gaps uh, in terms of control now that the uh, military and its state administrative council are no longer legitimate, no longer able to govern those parts of, of the country. So this is a clear trend of the further fragmentation of the country and the emergence of a lot of um, uh, very autonomous uh, ethnic controlled uh, regions. Of course, the other very significant actor, uh, and which is likely from uh, the vantage point of the population, the most legitimate uh, governance actor is the National Unity Government. Um, the National Unity Government was formed by the deposed lawmakers after the coup. Um, and it's taken moves to try to work towards the restoration of democracy in country. Um, the National Unity Government has uh, formed a consultative body called the National Unity Consultative uh, Council, which has been working to try to unite uh, all of these uh, very much um, atomized uh, ethnic armed organizations, looking at how it might bring all of these different actors together to mount uh, a common resistance to um, the, the military. Now, the NUG has appointed a lot of ministers. It's, it's worked at trying to build out a government. It's been communicating to the international community, building relationships with the international community. And it's also been working in country um, with a range of uh, what are known as people's defense forces. Um, these are individuals who decided following the coup that they were going to take up armed struggle to uh, restore democracy and to protect communities. So you've seen these forms of 
um, People's Defense Forces, um, there's, it's difficult to get actual numbers on how many of them there are. Uh, you know, one People's Defense Force might just simply be three people who've gone off into the jungle and some of the ethnic parts, ethnic controlled parts of the country where they'll be able to get uh, very simple military training, um, then move back into the core and take up uh, armed struggle against uh, the, the military and any of the functions of the state administrative council that might still be there in those, in those areas. Um, the National Unity Government announced uh, a people's defensive war in uh, May of last year. Um, it announced uh, throwing out the 2008 Constitution, which was a move that was somewhat popular amongst uh, some of the EAOs. And it's actually been able to build uh, something of a coalition, an alliance with EAOs, uh, particularly in Chin State along the Indian border and uh, um, in, in Kaya and Karen states on the Thailand border. That said though, again, you have the problem of the more powerful of the EAOs remaining quite distant from um, this, this, this multi-tiered conflict, looking more at how they might benefit from the ongoing chaos to strengthen themselves and to move towards their own political objectives. So these are some of the dynamics that you have there. Um, you have the NUG, which has a lot of legitimacy, which has been really trying to gain um, international support. It's been looking to see, you know, can they now, similar to Ukraine, get defense support? Uh, is it possible to have more governments maybe provide direct support to the, the NUG in response to uh, the coup as potentially a local solution to try to, um, to end uh, military rule? Fortunately, what you have right now, though, is a situation of stalemate. Um, Fighting is ongoing. The military does not seem to be able to defeat the PDFs. The PDFs have taken significant territory, even in the Burma heartland. So this is the very center of the country that is dominated by the Burma majority. Many of these PDFs have emerged as, as uh, uh, being able to control territory in, in some way, or at least having been able to push administrative actors of the uh, SAC out of their, their, their territories. Um, let me shift out a little bit now to talk about uh, some points that I'd like to pick up on the international response before we then uh, move on to, to the discussion part of, of the program. I think a few things to, to keep in mind. Um, uh, the, the ASEAN response has largely failed due to deep divisions within ASEAN, where you have uh, the majority of the maritime countries, that being Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Singapore, the Philippines, um, Brunei, these countries uh, on one hand have actually pushed for ASEAN to take more aggressive action um, to uh, leave the senior leaders of the military out of high level ASEAN meetings, which takes away from their legitimacy, and have also been pushing for a stronger means of implementing the five point uh, consensus that was agreed by ASEAN. Of course, the mainland countries, which are closer to China, um, have uh, gone in a different direction. This being uh, Cambodia, Laos, um, uh, Thailand in, in particular. Um, they have continued to do business with the coup regime. Um, they've in many ways worked to try to legitimize um, the military and they've continued business interactions, um, negotiated to discuss new agreements with this regime. So you can see here that there's deep divisions within a body that is making decisions based on consensus. And as a result of that, the Myanmar crisis has really been an ASEAN crisis insofar as the Myanmar issue threatens to cripple ASEAN. Uh, Myanmar itself is having perhaps more impact on ASEAN than ASEAN is having on the crisis in Myanmar. I think that's an important point to keep in mind. So ASEAN has not been able to deal with this. It's gonna be critical to the response. ASEAN centrality is a very important principle that ASEAN should be the central uh, institution for dealing with um, international challenges in the region, I think is something that's accepted and supported by the US, supported by China, supported by other countries. Um, however, we see that it's really going to need a much more robust response if we're gonna find a solution to this ongoing civil war and country. Now, one of the other major challenges here is that the border states, um, China and India in particular, the two powerful countries in the border, 
Both of them for different reasons have been supporting the coup regime. Uh, from China's vantage point, it's actually hedging bets. It's trying to uh, give legitimacy to the State Administrative Council. It's doing business with the SAC. It's pushing ASEAN to try to, rec to recognize the SAC. Um, but at the same time, it's also maintaining close ties with the ethnic armed organizations in the northern part of the country, giving them health aid, um, you know, deepening some economic cooperation with some of these actors, and really not using much leverage to, to prevent them from selling arms to the People's Defense Forces and from growing the powers of the People's Defense Forces. So you can see that clearly China has hedged bets, which gives it a bit of leverage in that overall uh, contest that you're going to see in the future between those ethnic armed groups and the, the SAC and the NUG. Now, from India's vantage point, it is also doing a similar type of, of strategy, but with an exception. Uh, India is focused also on building relations with the State Administrative Council. It's had lower level contacts with the NUG. It's been hosting some uh, IDPs, or sorry, some refugees in um, its northeastern states, which actually culturally are quite close to uh, the bordering states over on the Myanmar side of the border. But it has not built the same types of uh, relationships with EAOs that China has built. Why is India interacting with the SAC? Well, its arguments largely are based on the need to compete with China. If China is going to be interacting with the military and having relations with the military, and India has no skin in the game, then well, India is going to lose. Unfortunately, though, India's policy hasn't really built the same type of leverage that the Chinese policy has, as it doesn't maintain those strong, robust relations with some of the ethnic armed organizations. So here, you, what you see happening at the regional level is there's actually a lot of support that's going to the State Administrative Council, um, which makes it very difficult for there to be um, a uniform international uh, response. Turning to the US, which I think does have some important interests um, in, in Myanmar in terms of the investments that it's made in democracy, in terms of um, it being one of the largest donors in the ASEAN region, and also in terms of the US as a major investor in ASEAN and actually the number one investor in a lot of ASEAN countries. The US also has a dialogue partnership with ASEAN, which is important, and it certainly does not want to see uh, particularly as it's moving further in the direction of implementing the Indo-Pacific strategy, it does not want to see, um, you know, relations with ASEAN undermined by the Myanmar issue. So there's good reason why the U.S. needs to have a strong strategy to respond to the situation in country. And you've seen that. You've seen the U.S. try to impose costs. You've seen the U.S. do things to try to um, enhance the position of the national unity government and to maintain support to civil society uh, and other actors that are struggling uh, against uh, the military. Now, in our study group report, and I won't go out into all of these in that much detail, but you can see them here on the screen. These were some of the key recommendations that we came up with for US policy. And I'd like to highlight in particular one, um, the, the notion of uh, building out more assistance that can strengthen trust and unity amongst members of the opposition, because this is actually right now one of the key, I think, challenges that um, those struggling for democracy in country uh, ultimately face, is that the divisions, the lack of trust, um, those things, they simply aren't on the same page. Uh, a lot of that deals, of course, with the way that the NLD governed the country during the uh, period of democratic reforms. But um, really, this is, I think, one of the key challenges that the opposition faces. Uh, another key point, of course, is to continue um, international efforts uh, to advance humanitarian assistance. Reducing aid now is not uh, a good idea in that the needs in the country have only grown. However, you need to find ways to get that aid in without it um, uh, being usurped by the military or legitimizing the military. So that cross-border uh, effort to uh, bring assistance into the country is, is, is critical and looking at how U.S. partnerships, I mean, the U.S. can't do this alone. We saw just now the, the distance that the U.S. has between Myanmar, but the U.S. has a lot of partnerships you know, in India and in Thailand and across the ASEAN region. It really needs to look at how to strengthen those partnerships to make more cross-border assistance uh, possible. 
And then I'd also like to point out that uh, really investing further in um, future efforts for democracy in Myanmar is, is critical. So providing opportunities for the many people who have really struggled for a decade now to try to build democracy in Myanmar, uh, continuing to support their efforts through education, through keeping them in the game by supporting civil society. These things are also very important. And then lastly, building more ties with those uh, ethnic uh, nationalities groups across the country that do provide some governance is, is critical. These actors are more legitimate than the Myanmar military is. Um, China has relations with a number of these ethnic armed organizations. Thailand has some relations. Um, the U.S. could also do a lot more in terms of building stronger relationships and partnerships with some of the uh, non-state authorities that are, that are controlling territories, providing governance in many parts of, of the country. So these are a few things. I mean, the U.S. is already doing, I think, a lot of uh, these things, but these are a few areas where our study group identified maybe some avenues for the U.S. to, uh, to build out as it looks at how to continue its ongoing response to this a uh, very unfortunate situation uh, in Myanmar. Um, so let me go ahead and, and stop there. Thank you. Well, that was extraordinarily thorough, but it certainly didn't lift our spirits at all. <laughs> so, but <laughs> let's delve into a little bit more of this. I guess one of the questions that most people have because they have so associated the country with Aung San Suu Kyi, right? And truly, if you weren't following this, you were just a casual observer, you thought the country was doing fine. It had this, you know, wonderful leader that had cut, turned the corner and it was, you know, a kind of place you'd want to visit, right? And you'd want to be a part of. All of that crashed. But so what are the personalities now? What role is she playing now? Who's I mean, what's the personality of the person who's really running it? What general is really doing this? Can you share any of that with us? Yeah, so this is actually an interesting element. I mean, I don't think many people predicted the coup. Um, however, we did start to hear a few years even before the coup that General Ming An Lai, the, the, the senior leader of the military, um, had political ambitions uh, following his retirement. Um, the senior general, who's the perpetrator and architect of the coup, um, he uh, was supposed to retire from his position actually not long after the seating of the new government. And, you know, it was made quite clear, in fact, in many of my exchanges with um, uh, stakeholders in China, they would often ask questions of, well, would the U.S. entertain Ming An Lai as president? And time, many people would often laugh when they heard those sorts of, of assertions, but we do know that he certainly had those, those, those types of, of ambitions. And you know, I think it was also uh, partially a uh, clash of personalities between Da and Sun Tzu Chi and, and Ming An Lai, um, him really seeing himself as, as someone who, I guess within the, 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 the terms or narratives of the military had done quite uh, a lot in terms of defeating some of the insurgents in the China border area, particularly in uh, a small slice of territory uh, called Kokong, where um, in 2009, um, a huge military operation led by this general um, defeated one of the ethnic armed organizations, setting up a militia, a very corrupt militia that's now under the control of the military. So I think in terms of his own personal legacy, he was looking to try to maintain a very strong political role for himself which of course was not something that the NLD government wanted to entertain. It was looking at how to pull away uh, more of that uh, administrative power and authority from the military, particularly around the economy where the military tried to maintain strong control over the economy. But of course the NLD was moving in the direction of trying to promote further economic re reforms and to really try to revitalize more um, you know, bringing more private sector actors in and the like. And, and so you can see a lot of the tensions really emerging uh, uh, here. In terms of um, Aung San Suu Kyi, she has been in house arrest. Almost no one has been able to talk with her. There's ongoing trials uh, against her, trumped up charges for everything from having illegal walkie-talkies to violating COVID-19 restrictions. 
Um, but, you know, she's really been largely out of the picture with, of course, the exception that she has a lot of important symbolic meaning in country. And you really have now um, younger leaders of the NLD who managed to escape um, the, the coup, who weren't detained. Um, they're the ones, younger NLD uh, leaders are now largely leading this movement of the, the national unity government. So she's really under house arrest, has no contact, et cetera. I mean, it was a little disappointing, her attitude toward the Rohingya, uh, frankly, but, uh, but basically now she's sidelined, right? Yeah, she's, she's sidelined. And interestingly, you've also started to see the NUG take different directions with regard mm. to the, the Rohingya, um, you know, coming out very publicly in, in, in you know, acknowledging um, the crimes that had been committed against the Rohingya. And, you know, I think at least voicing the desire to have uh, some sort of, of, of process that looks at how to, um, you know, build reconciliation and think about, um, you, you know, the, the future of the country, uh, but from, you know, the vantage point of a more inclusive identity for, for Myanmar, of course, I think a lot of the, the um, ethnic groups, including the Rohingya, including, you know, Karen, Kachin, many other groups are still, um, you know, not, not certain as to the commitment of particularly some of the older NLD leaders. Um, so I think you still have that dynamic of distrust that's there, uh, but you have seen on the part of some of those um, younger leaders and, and some of those active within the NUG of, of really trying to reach out to uh, some of those different groups who received just horrible treatment both under uh, military rule as well as under the period of, of uh, the NLD government. Yeah, we have a question about that, that to let us get a little bit deeper into these ethnic issues. But before we do that, I really want to try to clarify something that is just baffling. Um, you would think with everything going on, the instability and the refugee crisis, right? And the narcotics, you would think that the states, at least the bordering states, would be also destabilized by this and that they would want to have more urgency in trying to deal with it. But we've gotten a picture of basic, you know, hands off apathy almost. Is that the correct perception? Well, I, I, I wouldn't quite categorize it that way. I think if you look at what China is doing along its border, I mentioned hedging bets, right? So yeah, most yeah. of the China Myanmar borderlands are controlled by uh, ethnic armed organizations that are within China's sphere of influence. Um, the United well, the United States Wa Army, for example. It uses Chinese currency, not Myanmar currency. It has a banking system that is uh, more connected to China's banking system. It doesn't even, you can't even get Myanmar currency out of the ATMs in, in that part of, of the country. So what China has done is it's um, really tried to use the northern states uh, on the border area, Shan and Kachin, as buffer states, you know, working with those ethnic armed organizations to try to keep COVID out, um, to try to push violence further south um, and, and to are try those to areas more stable? Landry. Are those areas that are under China's tutelage, so to speak, more stable and more secure? Uh, I, I would say yes, to, okay. to a great extent they are. Um, and in fact, you've seen again the ethnic armed groups in those areas, particularly the, the Kachin um, Independence Organization, um, which is in Kachin State, which kind of uh, sits on the western side of, of the China border. Um, that particular armed group has expanded its area of operations. It's actually operating now down in the southern state of Sagai. Um, so you've seen it start to be able to uh, really have a lot more control and influence than it had you know, a couple of years ago. And it's, um, you know, it's fighting the military. So there is fighting going on. There will from time to time be fighting that comes into the China border area. So there is some instability still, but I would argue that comparatively speaking, if you look at what's going on in the core right now uh, in areas like Sagai or Mugwai where the uh, air raids have been very uh, consistent, you know, I think there the violence is much more serious than what you have on the China border. Okay, one of the questions that comes in, we, we brought up the issue of how just the poverty that's there. And, and uh, so the question is, are, is this poverty just across all ethnic groups or do some groups have it harder than others? Yeah, that, that's also a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, economically speaking, 
all groups, unfortunately, are going to suffer as a result of this, right? I mean, I don't think there's any way out of that because, you know, trade is decimated. Uh, the instability is spilling over. There's more of a focus on security than there can be on, on economic uh, uh, development and activity in all parts of the country. So you're seeing, I think, the impacts that are uh, reverberating, you know, kind of across uh, uh, Myanmar. Um, there's going to be less willingness, I think, of a lot of international businesses to deal with uh, really anyone from Myanmar, regardless of whether they're, you know, in the Kachin controlled areas or the Kuren controlled areas or, or anywhere else. So I don't think that, uh, you know, the coup has uh, provided, you know, a lot of new legitimate business opportunities for any of these stakeholders, but where there has been something of uh, a windfall, of course, is in arms transfers, right? I mean, you've got the population arming up, meaning they need to get arms from somewhere. So a lot of small arms sales are going on. Um, you're seeing, you know, again, the narcotics, there's, there's lots of um, uh, evidence that, you know, post-coup, um, these different uh, criminal cities that have been carved out in the Thai and um, uh, China borderlands were really Law enforcement has no reach into these areas. Um, crime is, 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 is on its way up as there is no responsible you know, central government authority that is able to crack down on this in any way. So the illicit economy seems to be on the rise, whereas the uh, formal uh, illicit economy is, 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 is falling. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about narcotics because that is a, a, an American issue. I mean, we, we're trying to keep, 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 especially meth and all of this stuff that's killing people in our area. Why don't we see what's going on in, in Myanmar as really central to stability in the United States and to the crime situation in the US? Is that argument ever made? Yeah, I, I think that argument definitely is made. I mean, there's, there's a major focus uh, at the regional level on, on trying to take steps to do something about some of this uh, narcotic uh, activity. And certainly you hear uh, constantly in the news, you know, information about captures and, and um, uh, really almost on a daily basis, you're hearing about different volumes of, of meth coming across borders that are seized or, or that are captured. Um, so, so there's a recognition of the challenges. It's just unfortunately, you know, um, a lot of this activity is taking place in areas that you don't have control of, of any central authorities, right? So um, in, in the, the United Law State Territory or in parts of, of uh, Northern Shan State, for example, that are in China's sphere of influence, it's, it's perhaps much easier for China to try to do something to crack down on, on some of these activities uh, than it would be for the U.S. to do that or for Thailand to do that. Maybe Thailand, to some extent, has influence and ability to gather intelligence on what's going on uh, in those territories, but ultimately China is going to have the most influence. So I think if we want to be able to effectively deal with these issues, we're going to uh, ultimately either need to have, you know, authorities in Myanmar that are responsible and able to uh, address these sorts of problems um, effectively in partnership with the U.S. and other countries, or we're really going to have to look at, you know, are there ways to to push China to deal more effectively with some of these issues, given that this is in those borderlands that are kind of in its uh, sphere of influence. And China, not India. You're you're, you're really saying China is, or or perhaps I I heard from the from the video Australia, but. Well, I, I mean, um, India definitely is, is a key player here. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges for, for India is that if you look at India's uh, northeastern states, India has a lot of challenges around insurgency as well. So mm -hmm. this is really insurgent yeah. groups based in Myanmar that are, you know, kind of coming back across into India, trying to push for autonomy or to uh, struggle against uh, central Indian authorities. So I think when India looks at this, it's also looking at the situation from how to control these insurgency movements and certainly insofar as narcotics is one tool used by uh, some insurgent groups as a source of revenue for ongoing arms struggle I think India is concerned about some of these issues but again the question is one of leverage because India's default position has been for some time now to lean on 
um, the Myanmar military to try to deal with these insurgency problems. And it hasn't really engaged so much directly with uh, a lot of the um, ethnic armed organizations that are you know, based in the India borderland and that are struggling for autonomy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the Myanmar central authorities. Well, I, we, we're coming to the end of our period, but I want to throw just a few quick things out at you. What, one quick question is, is Myanmar likely to become still another site for a naval base for China is the question. Is that in China's interest? Well, I mean, we, we've known that since the 1980s, the mid 1980s, um, China, particularly Southwestern China, has looked to Myanmar for access to the Indian Ocean. Um, this relates a lot to China's own domestic politics, but, um, you know, the southwestern provinces are landlocked. Uh, they've developed much more slowly than the coastal provinces, which became quite wealthy um, throughout the 1980s and 1990s. So uh, Yunnan province, which is a province right there on the border with Myanmar, it devised a strategy of accessing the uh, Indian Ocean directly through Myanmar. And over the past decade, you've seen the Chinese build a strategic energy pipeline that links uh, the city of Kunming and most of China's Southwest to uh, gas resources along the Indian Ocean. Um, you know, China has large uh, facilities already on islands that are um, in the Indian Ocean along the coastal province of Rakhine State, uh, which are used to you know, pump the, the gas, bring Saudi oil uh, across Myanmar and into China. So you see already the, the direction that China is taking in terms of its own strategic plans, um, which are really, I think, um, looking at how to um, lessen dependence on the Malacca Straits, which a lot of Chinese analysts will say, uh, you know, that's kind of under the, the US military umbrella. So going through the Indian Ocean and building access to a second ocean is of strategic interest for China. So I would think that insofar as China looks to have energy security through Myanmar, as it looks to build out a deep water port in Chapu, which is one of its most um, important uh, plans, planned projects for, for Myanmar, and which has continued following the coup in terms of looking at how to um, move towards implementing that, 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 uh, that project. You're, you're seeing kind of more in that direction that China is trying to build this port facility, is trying to build out this special economic zone adjacent to its, uh, its oil and gas uh, pipeline uh, in, uh, in Chapu. So, so clearly this is of strategic importance for all of Southwest China. Um, and it's something that China is really pushing to, to continue into the future. Well, you've been very generous with your expertise and with your time. I'm going to throw one other question at you and then I'm going to let you start your day and we'll end <laughs> our day here. But I, it, 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 the scenario that we have, that I have, heard here really argues for a, simply a breakdown into in the country period with ethnic groups simply controlling their own areas and just breaking up Burma and not trying to have a, a, a big Myanmar. What, what are your thoughts that that could simply happen? Well, I, I mean, in de facto terms, we're, we're really seeing some of the EAOs go in that direction. And I mean, of course, already the United Wa State Army up in the China border, um, it's certainly in terms of how it's administered, it's much, much closer to what you'll see in China than uh, it is to anything that you would see uh, in, in lower Burma. Um, a lot of the other EAOs are in some ways looking at Wa as a model. So for Rakhine State, you know, they, they've, the Arakan Army has developed uh, this, this plan that they refer to as the, the Way of Rakita, uh, which is really a movement towards uh, a restoration of a historical empire that you had uh, kind of in those areas in Rakhine State and in Southern Jin State. Uh, but, but looking at how you would build out a similar form of autonomy as to what you have in, in, in Wa State in, in Arakan, you're seeing consolidation in Chin State, you're seeing consolidation in Kachin State. Mm -hmm. So that trajectory that a lot of the EAOs are on are really moving more towards what you see already in terms of a very autonomous, um, quite, quite independent in terms of how it's, it's operating domestically. Um, 
uh, moving in, in that general, I, I think, uh, direction in, in the future. So, so there certainly is uh, that risk. I mean, of course, the, the Myanmar military has always seen itself as the glue that keeps the country together. So it's likely that it will try to keep fighting. I mean, it's, it's glue, unfortunately, is to use violence to compel these groups to, to stay as part of the union. But I think you will still, still see, um, unless we're able to bring some kind of an end to um, the military's ongoing um, campaigns against the population in country, I think you'll still see those, those, those ethnic uh, nationality groups move further in the direction of creating a buffer between themselves and the Myanmar military, which they see as, as very hostile, which they see as not a legitimate actor that they would want to, to build peace with, but really as an actor that they'd like to um, you know, shield themselves from as much as possible. Well, again, thank, this is certainly a complex issue, but one that I do think uh, you know, is, should be important, not only for that region, but for most of the world. It, it just sounds just horrible. And it, it also sounds like it's, it's, a, it's a factor that will destabilize that region as well as continue the problems we may have in this country with drugs. So, but with that, I do want to thank you, Jason. And, and again, thank the United States Institute of Peace, where I was a peace fellow many eons oh, ago. Wonderful. It was a wonderful time in my life, yes. But uh, it's a great organization. And I do urge um, our viewers and all that, if you're in Washington, consider going for a tour or, or visiting. I don't know if it can do it now because of COVID. I think you guys are they are probably still in a, somewhat of a, a a restricted visiting state, but it's um, look up online and you'll see all the wonderful work that USIP is doing around the world. So with that, Jason, thank you so much and stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again. It's a real pleasure to have uh, I've had the opportunity. Uh, appreciate it. All righty. Bye-bye. And thank you everyone for joining us. See you in two weeks. Bye-bye.